Hello and welcome to Interpreting India. I'm Srinath Raghavan and this is a podcast presented by Carnegie India. Every two weeks, we bring to you voices from India and around the world as we unpack the role of technology, the economy and foreign policy in shaping India's relationship with the world. In the light of the recent coronavirus outbreak, we are now recording and producing episodes of Interpreting India remotely. Just over a month ago, representatives from the Afghan government and the Taliban met in Doha to begin negotiations to end the nearly two decade long war in Afghanistan. This event marked the culmination of almost three years of discussions between the Taliban, the United States and the government in Kabul. These discussions also included other regional actors to bring peace to the country. Despite these positive developments, the road to peace is anything but straightforward. With numerous divisions in the Kabul government and the Taliban, with regional rivalries in play, as well as a faltering American military commitment to the country, several analysts question the possibility of an eventual peace deal coming out of this process in Doha. In this episode of Interpreting India, we dive into the recent inter-Afghan negotiations and consider the prospects of peace in that war-torn country. To discuss the negotiations now underway, I have with me Anatol Levin and Rudra Chaudhary. Anatol is a professor at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service in Qatar. He's also a senior fellow at the New America Foundation. He has previously taught at King's College London and worked as a journalist in South Asia and the former Soviet Union till 1998. Anatol is the author of several acclaimed and prize-winning books on Central and South Asia, including most recently, Pakistan, a heart country. Rudro is the director of Carnegie India. He works on the diplomatic history of South Asia and contemporary security issues. He is the author of the book Forged in Crisis, India and the United States since 1947. Apart from his work with Carnegie, Rudro is also a senior lecturer at King's College London and a visiting professor at Ashoka University. He is also the founding director of the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Officers Diplomatic Academy for South Asia. Anatol, Rudy, welcome to Interpreting India. Delighted to have you both with us today. Hello. Thank you, Srinath. Delighted to be here. Anatol, since you are based in Qatar, uh, perhaps we should begin by asking you to walk us through the background to the inaugural meetings that have happened in the inter-Afghan talks as they're being built. Uh, could you just give us a sense of what are the main developments that led to the talks and what are the issues that are most likely to be on the table uh, as part of the agenda of discussion at least in the initial rounds so to speak well i mean what brought the the, the two afghan sides to the table uh, is is quite frankly uh, simply the uh, the growing us impetus for complete withdrawal um you know under trump uh, trump has made it very clear he wants to withdraw completely he of course has now actually announced a complete withdrawal uh, by the end of the year that is naturally part of his election campaign uh, but um, even without that uh, it was becoming very clear that um, the trump administration was moving towards withdrawal and also if you look at the history of biden's involvement with afghanistan it would seem pretty unlikely that biden would want to reverse that uh, and so of course um that created tremendous pressure uh, on the um the, the kabul in government uh, the government in kabul uh, to um open negotiations with the taliban you know rather than leaving it um until after the americans withdraw uh, when of course the position of the kabul government will be greatly weakened um as to what they're talking about um the you know the the fundamental issue in the intra afghan talks is power sharing it's it's power uh, it is how the taliban can be given a real share uh, a really important share of power formal power within afghanistan without this simply collapsing the existing afghan state uh, everything else you know all the talk about the constitution and women's rights and democracy and everything else they are all secondary to that in my view um the issue is power and of course that includes not just 
government power, but it includes power at the regional level and provincial level. Uh, and uh, most importantly of all, in the end, it involves power over the security forces, you know, who will, in the last analysis, uh, have a dominant say uh, over the army and police in the different parts of the country. Rudy, and I thought spoke about this being an intra-Afghan talk, and we know that there are two parties on the table, uh, the Taliban and the government in Kabul. Uh, but we also know that neither of these is really a coherent, or at least not a fully coherent, certainly not a homogenous entity. The Taliban is itself uh, set to be divided between various kinds of moderate and radical factions. Uh, the Afghan government in Kabul was quite divided with President Ashraf Ghani on the one side and the former chief executive Abdullah Abdullah on the other competing for uh, political dominance. So given this kind of fractured coalitions which have come to the table, so to speak, uh, how do you think their divisions are likely to play into the talks? Or is it that these divisions will be set aside and the two parties will actually be able to negotiate with a certain kind of a united front on either side? So thanks, Srinath. I think strangely, the glue that's holding both parties together, so the Taliban on the one side and Afghan interlocutors and the government on the other, is actually the Americans. As Anatol mentioned, this is very much an American-led process. And in fact, even amongst the various American actors involved in this process, it's really the remarkable position taken by Zalmay Khalilza, the special representative, who somehow has been able to buck the trend, garner support within DC, create a bridge, not only in Islamabad, in Pakistan, but also in Kabul. Um, and I think as long as the Americans and as long as Khalil Zad is in office and is able to shepherd this process, the frictions that we see on both sides, and they're deep frictions, will be bridged at least from the outset. Now, having said that, I think on the Taliban side, it's very clear that there is a division now between those who are considered to be the conveyor belt Taliban. So people like Mullah Baradar, who it might be worth remembering, was once in a Pakistani jail, um, who's now leading the negotiations in Qatar, and the ground level troops. Um, splits have taken place. Our good colleague and friend David Loyan has reported on some of this. Defections are rife. Number of old Taliban have become members of ISIS or Khorasan inside of Afghanistan. And I think it's worth keeping in mind that those divisions remain. And how they play out, um, I think time will tell. My own sense is it won't be very pretty, um, especially if the Americans are, are changed leadership in November, for instance. Um, on the Afghan government side, just very quickly, um, I think two points. One is, as you rightly mentioned, there was this kind of very clear struggle between Abdullah and Ghani. It took them months to come together. It was under American pressure. Finally, they agreed to a division by which Abdullah became the High Council for National Reconciliation head, hence he becomes the person leading the negotiations on the Taliban, which puts a lot of onus on um, the Taliban itself. Abdullah Abdullah is someone who's been much more reserved about Taliban negotiations. He's supported by people up in the northern part of Afghanistan who are still openly anti-Taliban. Um, so I think deep divisions remain, but as I said, the only bridge that's holding all these parties together is actually even more than the Americans. I'd say it's one man, it's Salme Khalilza. Uh, Anatol, how do you sort of see that particular reading? I mean, is, is it really down to one person there? Uh, what's, what's your sort of reading about the state, particularly of the Taliban and what their structure of this negotiation is going to be? Well, I, I think Rudy is absolutely right. As far as the Americans are concerned, yes, um, you know, it, it is really one man who has been leading the whole process, you know, Khalil Zad, uh, because it's not as if you know Trump or indeed any of his senior people know anything about Afghanistan, uh, or indeed, to be honest, care anything about Afghanistan. Uh, whereas Khalil Zad, in his own way, does, of course, naturally. Um, but uh, as I think. You know, Richard Holbrook found as well before he uh, he, he died. Um, it is very very difficult to broker a, a peace settlement uh, in Afghanistan um, because of the realities on the ground, and also because, as you and Rudy have said, uh, both sides, but in my view, particularly the Kabul government, 
are deeply fragmented. Now, as far as the Taliban is concerned, I have never been entirely happy with the the, the term um, extremist or radical and moderate, because I think that in the end, they have the same ultimate goal. It's just a question of how to get there. Um, or at least the, the same ultimate ideal goal. There have been absolute, you know, diehard radicals in the Taliban. But I think it's fair to say that most of those have probably left to join ISIS. Um, and of course, the Taliban is now bitterly hostile to ISIS. That's one reason why um, the, uh, the, the, the Taliban has been receiving much more sympathy in Moscow, for example, as an enemy of ISIS, uh, and indeed in Washington too. Uh, but um, I think the basic division within the Taliban is between those who believe and want an early, complete victory. In other words, they believe that the Americans will definitely leave very soon, and then they can essentially roll up the Kabul regime uh, and take complete power in Afghanistan again. Um, and my own judgment would be that that would probably be true of the, you know, the Haqqani network and their allies. Uh, and then others uh, who, um, of course, <laughs> would also like to take complete power in Afghanistan and hope to do so at some point in future, uh, but are willing to compromise you know, in the, uh, in the shorter term, uh, partly in order to get the Americans out and then to give the Americans a decent interval to make their way into a share of power uh, in Afghanistan. And then if that doesn't work, as I believe it won't work, to aim for, you know, for complete power later. Um, remembering, of course, that, you know, I was a journalist in Pakistan and Afghanistan in the late 80s, and all of us, foolishly expected the, the then communist regime in Afghanistan to collapse within a matter of weeks after the Soviets withdrew in early 1989. Actually, the then Kabul regime of Najibullah outlasted the Soviet Union itself, um, partly because with the Soviets gone, there was, you know, everybody uh, who wasn't part of the Mujahideen felt a very strong impetus to come together to try to save themselves from Mujahideen victory. Um, so one could see that again. The one thing, but I mean, one, one must keep in mind that there are, there are certain things on which no member of the Taliban, no member of the Taliban will compromise. Um, the, the, of course, they're not going to disarm and become simply a, an Afghan political movement. I mean, nobody in Afghanistan disarms. The Taliban certainly won't. Um, there is no way that they are not going to demand a, a dominant position, not necessarily, you know, not explicit rule, but an, a dominant position uh, in the east and south of the country, you know, their core territories. Now, of course, formulae can be found to, you know, to, to soften this, you know, whereby it's not actual Taliban people in control, but people sort of nominated by the Taliban. Uh, but I mean that for me is the you know, is the absolute bottom line um, of the Taliban. They are I mean and which unites absolutely you know what I would call the pragmatists uh, and the um, the hardliners or the or the pragmatic the pragmatists or the um, moderates and the extremists. Um, they they cannot give up you know even in the short term uh, the demand for a share of power. Uh, unless, of course, they, as I believe many of them do, are willing just to sit things out, uh, either you know, in the peace process or agree to something provisionally that they have no intention of sticking to uh, in the longer run. Um, once again, in the conviction that once the Americans are out, they'll never come back again. Um, and after a certain decent interval, you know, the whole place will fall into a uh, into the Taliban's hands anyway, which, you know, I'm quite sure is a calculation among many of them. That's interesting. Rudy, you know, one thing which we have noticed is that the Taliban has become stronger on the ground over the last three to four years, certainly, right? Uh, they now control fairly large swathes of the countryside. Um, 
their strength is rising even as American will to remain in Afghanistan in any significant military presence uh, is dwindling. Uh, so clearly, there is going to be some kind of a relationship between facts on the ground, so to speak, in terms of the kinds of military situations. And and it already alluded to the fact that there is at least one section of the Taliban which feels that they can roll the government up pretty quickly in short order, so to speak, once the Americans leave. But whichever way it plays out, I mean, the fact that they are now dominant in the ground in the south and the east, perhaps, does give them uh, a certain kind of leverage on the negotiating table itself. So I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts on how the military and the diplomatic sides of these two things will play out in the coming months as these talks progress. Yeah, I think, you know, you're absolutely right. I think there is a, the largest faction within the Taliban, which is the Haqqanis, which, by the way, are part of the negotiations. They've been part of the Doha negotiations. They were represented on the 29th of February when the American sign was essentially, as I see it, a withdrawal agreement, um, where the blueprint is that in time it becomes a peace agreement, but at the moment it's just a withdrawal agreement. So they are certainly playing the part. You know, I think they've realized that being part of the inner circle helps, but they have they are the largest funded and the largest exercised military faction on the ground in itself. My own sense is a lot will depend on the extent to which the West and other parts of the world is able to support Afghanistan militarily and diplomatically. And that will then in time calculate the extent to which different Taliban factions are essentially able to go at their own way um, and attempt mini coups or attempt a all out capture of certain parts of Afghanistan, which I'm sure is, is likely. Um, you know, down the line, we may just get what the former British ambassador to Kabul, Sherrod Cooper Coles, once basically called a fortified Afghanistan. So you'll have five fortified cities in the southeast, west, and the north. And essentially, a good part of rural Afghanistan will be led by Taliban with some sort of an informal arrangement with the government. Um, and, as I, and I think things are going to heat up quite fast, primarily, as Anatol mentioned. Trump has already made a statement. It's a political statement with the campaign in America in mind. He wants American troops out by Christmas. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in America, the United States, has come out very strongly saying, look, it's not feasible. Um, the military has come out in the United States saying is that at best you should reduce to four and a half thousand troops, which provides enough of a buffer for counterterrorism, for overwatch. Um, but end of the day, it's a political call. And I think if the Americans withdraw very fast in the next couple of months, it will only harden the elements that I think, as Anatol rightly mentioned, are essentially waiting it out. Um, Anatol, apart from being a... Uh, I think, uh, sorry, if I could just... Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, please do come in. Yeah. The, the Haqqanis are very, very, very tough after all they've been fighting for more than 40 years now. Um, and they, you know, they aim at complete victory. But of course, um, the very fact that they've been fighting for 40 years also shows that they can be patient. Um, from everything I gather, they understand very well, you know, the meaning of decent interval, mm -hmm. as they used to say in Vietnam. So, you know, we don't have to rush things. Once the Americans are out, the game is probably, as they see it, in our hands anyway, so they can afford to wait. I mean, I do see the Taliban, they're not, they're obviously not nearly as disciplined and unified as as the North Vietnamese communists. Um, but you know, as we now know, there were pretty considerable differences between tactical differences between the North Vietnamese communists uh, about how to approach um, the war in the South, how to approach the negotiating process. But in the end, every single one of them was committed to the takeover of the South as, um, you know, as their ultimate goal. I, I think uh, Rudy raised an, a, a very uh, interesting and important point, you know, quoting Sherard about the possible de facto, not de jure, of course, but de facto partition of Afghanistan into different zones. And there, there, there could be real divisions in future among the Taliban, uh, because I know that there are those, especially after you know, they've had talks with the Iranians, 
who realize that if they try to do what they did in the later 90s and simply take over the entire country and you know rule it by themselves, that that would turn certainly Iran, um, possibly Russia as well, uh, against them. I mean, Iranians have made very clear to me that they, they will support Hazara. They have short-term tactical reasons to support the Taliban against the Americans. And they recognize that the Taliban will play a vital role in Afghanistan in future. They can't stop that. But they say that they remain you know, committed to the Hazara as old Shia allies. And they also say that they are absolutely determined to keep Herat out of the hands of any potentially anti-Iranian force, including the Taliban. So that is a thing to keep in mind for the future. You know, the the, the partition of Afghanistan is a, is a possibility. Uh, the question is along what lines and whether the Taliban, enough of the Taliban would accept that or whether, as in the 90s, um, instead of, you know, allowing the Tajiks and Herat and the Hazara to go on ruling themselves and the Uzbeks, they would aim for total victory. There, I think, is where perhaps one might see, but this is, of course, a long way down the road, uh, real gaps you know, opening within the Taliban. Very important point, because you know, I think there's a lot of studies, including your own work, uh, which suggests that you know, the Taliban have a certain vision of Pashtun nationalism at the core of their sort of identity, right? So uh, I'm just wondering whether a truncated, partitioned Afghanistan will satisfy those kinds of nationalist aspirations which the Taliban might harbor. That, that's a very important point. And, you know, on the Pashtun nationalist uh, thing, it's it's very interesting to note that d- despite several Pakistani requests, uh, the Taliban have repeatedly and consistently refused to recognize the Durand line uh, as the international frontier of Afghanistan. Now, I mean, of course, <clears throat> that's not to say that they would do anything about it. and. You know, this is obviously to to maintain their nationalist credentials within Afghanistan. But I mean, it's it it is interesting that despite all the help they've got from Pakistan, they were not prepared to agree to that. Uh, as you said, they are indeed Pashtun nationalists as well as Islamists. So we'll come back to Pakistan, uh, and I want to have a more substantive discussion uh, on Pakistan itself. But I just want to sort of go back to a point that Rudy was making, which is about the. You know, the, the peculiar position of the United States at this juncture, right? I mean, we are, what, three weeks uh, before an American presidential election is going to happen. And Anatole, you've written uh, insightfully about American nationalism as well as personal nationalism. So you know what is at stake in that election. Uh, but I'm just wondering, I mean, obviously, it's, you know, we are still speculating. But uh, what is your sense? I mean, it, does this election and its outcome have any decisive bearing for what is happening in the talks between the Afghan government and the Taliban, or is it totally extraneous to that? Well, I mean, if Trump gets away with complete withdrawal by Christmas, then obviously that would have a tremendous effect. Uh, I would say that the signs are that he will not be able to because of, you know, the... the, um, military opposition and actually just logistical difficulties, you know, there'll be an enormous amount of equipment to pull out. Uh, I don't believe that a Biden victory uh, will make a colossal difference. I I mean, the, as far as I can see, the the absolute um, American desire now uh, apart from certain elements, you know, in the Pentagon, uh, is is to leave. Um, but on the other hand, of course, th- there is the, the the factor which the the, um, the Pentagon plays on, uh, which is, of course, that nobody wants to to be in power in Washington if or when the Kabul regime collapses, uh, you know, and you get masses of refugees, you know, the, um, an American general said to me quite candidly, I mean, what we're fighting for is to prevent images like Saigon in 1975. You know, right. it's a question of American, uh, American national and military prestige. So, of course, that is a restraining factor. Um, but, uh, you, you know, the, 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 the desire is to get out if this can be done without humiliation. Uh, and also, of course, the the other point is that if, um, if any chance the existing level of American 
forces. And that means, above all, air forces. I mean, they are the critical factor in preserving the government position in the South. Um, these prove inadequate to hold the Taliban back. I would judge that it would be quite impossible for a future American administration, um, Democrat or Republican, actually to reinforce those forces. I mean, maybe air forces to a degree, yes, but I can't see any circumstances whatsoever in which a U.S. administration will send um, ground, a lot, you know, additional ground forces back into Afghanistan. So in that sense, some of the Taliban calculation may well be accurate, which is that if the Americans are getting out, they're gone for good. I think so, yes. Okay. Uh, Rudy, what's your whole sense about the U.S. presidential election and its kind of relationship to this particular um, story? But, you know, I, I think I'll, I'll put it more forcefully. I think for me, the question is pretty simple, is that if Trump's political hedge, which is clearly a political hedge, which is to suggest that, you know, it's part of the campaign to say that I will bring all Americans back to America by Christmas, if he actually follows through on that by the beginning of November, I think you will just very directly be handing over the Taliban an undue advantage. And they're very clear. I mean, look at the Taliban tweets in supporting Trump's position on this, supporting his re-election. And they're very clear about the fact that when the Biden crew comes into power, if the Biden crew comes into power, it's going to be a much harder set of negotiations. And here, I think it's very clear in some of the interviews that we've done for some of the for a Carnegie paper recently is that the Taliban fully understand that a Biden administration will a keep a keep a residual American force inside of Afghanistan for quite some time. Biden has written on this long time ago. He stands by it in his campaign pledge. Um, he says it's for primarily counterterrorism reasons. But number two, and the fact is that whether you know we like it or not, and whether we think it's appropriate or not at this point in the negotiation, there'll be a range of other, not red lines, but a number of other issues around rights that will be brought back to the table. And I can't see a Biden administration, people like Susan Rice or Elizabeth Warren or a whole range of other actors getting back onto this table with the Taliban without bringing up rights. And they may be doing it for political reasons, um, or otherwise, but I do think the Taliban suspect that if that were the case, um, negotiations are actually going to dial back in a, um, they're going to reverse. And what about the man who you said is more or less pivotal to this entire exercise, uh, Zalmay Khalilzad? Do you think he's, he's going to stay on if there's a change in government? I mean, my bet would be he'd be gone. Um, I just don't see how a political appointee at that level would stay on. I mean, it would be very smart for the Biden administration to keep Khalil Zad on. He's got a lot of equity. He somehow managed to keep a balance between a tricky triangular relationship between Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. I mean, on the, he was in Doha on the 12th. He flew to Islamabad after that. He was in India two or three days after. So clearly, he's somebody who has the trust or he has the confidence of leaders in these three very competitive countries. Um, he has the trust of the American administration, some parts of the bureaucracy. So I think at some level it would be, you would you would want Khalil Zad to stay on, but I'm not quite sure if Khalil Zad's position on these issues of, of reconciliation, especially the red lines that I was talking about, will be actually acceptable to the Biden administration. But Anatole, if I may ask, what do you think? I mean, I hope so. And you know, if, after all, you know, Biden was in the Obama administration, and Obama, of course, kept a number of senior Bush administration people on, most notably Robert um, Gates. So I think it's possible. Um, but uh, you know, you know what American politics is like, and desire of the Democrats simply to make a clean sweep of anything related to Trump might might well prevail. Um, uh, as far as you know, the, these issues of women's rights and so forth, uh, uh, of course, without wishing to sound too cynical, um, you know, these Taliban pragmatists we were talking about, uh, you know, might well be tempted to sign almost anything to get the Americans out. Um, you know, uh, uh, sign you know, th their signature to something does not frankly mean very much. 
um, they have, you know, ne never regarded um, agreements made with infidels as in any way binding, if you see what I mean. So, um, uh, of course, I mean, there will be others within the Taliban who would refuse categorically to to, to sign anything of that sort. But, um, it, you know, it, it is possible that, uh, you know, the, the Taliban might agree to some very surprising things, <laughs> might pretend to agree to some very surprising things, simply in order to get the Americans out. Yeah, sure. And in any case, I think we should just remind ourselves that, you know, uh, a, a Trump re-election is not a foregone conclusion, at least not yet. So let's just switch gears and talk a little bit about some of the other uh, powers, regional powers particularly, who, who are likely to have some kind of an influence in the way that this process uh, shapes up. Anatol, you, you spoke briefly about Iran and their desire to kind of keep their traditional sort of relationships and influence uh, in the Western parts of Afghanistan where the Shia sort of uh, population is large. Uh, you, you kind of briefly alluded to the Russians and their concerns about the ISIS, which is disposing them somewhat favorably to the Taliban. Could you just, you know, perhaps elaborate on what you think are the main considerations for Iran and Russia? Well, Iran has a sort of short to medium term tactical interest in Afghanistan, uh, which is simply that um, if, uh, God forbid, Trump is re-elected, and this leads to an American or American-Israeli attack on Iran, uh, the Taliban are actually the best way that Iran has of hitting back hard against the Americans. Because, you know, I've taken part in some of these scenario um, building exercises. Uh, it's you know, unless the the Iranian government is utterly reckless, which I don't think it is, uh, attacking America directly or American forces directly uh, would be exceptionally dangerous for Iran. And that would apply probably by extension to attempts to block the Gulf, you know, or attack Saudi and UAE uh, oil refineries and ports and so forth. Uh, Unleashing Hezbollah against um, against Israel is also highly problematic, partly because um, uh, there's no evidence that Hezbollah wants to do that. It has no interest in provoking yet another war with Israel at this stage. And you know, Hezbollah are not simply Iranian puppets. Whereas, of course, if the Iranians were to provide serious amounts of weapons to um, to the Taliban, um, you know, the, the Taliban so far have been fighting with very very you know, basic military technology, that could be seriously changed. But I think the Iranians will only do that if America itself attacks them. And um, they say that, you know, for reasons of, well, for ancient historical reasons, and also for reasons of contemporary credibility, that their ultimate position in Iran, you know, remains what it was, which is support for their old allies. Um, what the Iranians and the Russians share, I think, is two things. Um, one is a recognition, which I suppose everybody more or less agrees on now, which is that the Taliban cannot be eliminated or defeated, that whatever happens, they will play an important role in Afghanistan in the future. And therefore, you know, we will have to deal with them. Uh, the second point, of course, is uh, hostility to uh, ISIS. Uh, which both Russia and Iran view as a much greater threat. Uh, and But of course, the third point is that um, the Iranians and, and Russians uh, are both very anxious to get American bases out of Afghanistan. So um, those are the three, you know, the three objectives they are, they are seeking. Um, without, of course, either of them wanting a, a complete Taliban victory. You know, they um, neither the Russians nor the Chinese are anxious to have a, you know, a Taliban, a Taliban frontier on the Amu Darya, uh, because then, after all, you know, the Taliban leadership now looks, uh, you know, it's it's been assuring us for many years that they're not an international jihadi force; they have no ambitions beyond Afghanistan. Uh, but that could change. Uh, but that, incidentally, is also why. Um, you know, the more sensible members of the Pakistani establishment uh, do not want a complete Taliban victory in Afghanistan because then they, they fear 
that a combination of you know, Islamism and Pashtun nationalism could once again make Afghanistan a threat to Pakistan. Uh, so, you know, there are all these different agendas, you know, within the same establishment, um, which they're trying to pursue simultaneously, uh, which is pretty difficult to do, actually. Right. Rudy, do you want to sort of add to any of this? Yeah, I mean, apart from Pakistan, I think the if you're talking about regional actors, I think two countries that have, you know, I think surprised many in the way that they have pivoted to the realities in Afghanistan is Russia and China. Um, now, a lot has been made about Russia's pivotal role. They invited the Taliban out in Beijing last year. They've been part of a variety of negotiations as recently as July of this year but alongside Pakistan. But, you know, I think the Chinese position seems to be pretty clear, which is a practical one, which is basically buying peace in Afghanistan. Um, all the road networks that they're building out between Khyber Pakhtunkhwa in Pakistan across the Durand line into Afghanistan, um, you know, is only possible with some kind of Taliban, essentially a fee. It's a, you know, in, in, I think in Hindi, what we would call it, it's a hafta. And I think that's the way they seem to be kind of building out peace. Russia's position, I think, is interesting. My, my own sense is that this is the only, really the second time where Russia has stepped into the region and taken a position um, which is quite unusual. I think the first time was in 1965. When India and Pakistan fought a war, the Americans abdicated their position, Britain abdicated, and the Russians stepped in. Um, and I think they've done exactly the same in Afghanistan today. And you know, here you've got veterans who know Afghanistan well, people like Zamir Kubulov, who was the former Afghan ambassador to Kabul. He knows the field well. He's been a critique of the NATO mission for a very long time. And I think it's has energized those in Russia to say that look, this is part of our backyard and we should take it seriously. Now, um, so I think, you know, both these actors have played an in, important role, um, you know, in, in very different ways. And I think they'll continue to do so because for the Chinese, this is part and parcel of the BRI. For Russia, this is part and parcel of um, vacating the West from Afghanistan. Sure. Anatol, I wanted you to sort of weigh in a little bit on this um, Sino-Pakistan kind of equation as it plays in the context of Afghanistan. You know, uh, it is striking that, you know, the Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan recently wrote an op-ed in the New York Times, uh, which effectively said that, you know, cautioning the Americans against a hasty exit from Afghanistan, but also effectively pledging that Pakistan would respect Afghanistan's sovereignty, uh, you know. And I'm just wondering, given the various kinds of concerns that you outlined that the Pakistani establishment has, uh, but also now their increasing kind of economic dependence on China and the importance that the China-Pakistan economic corridor of the Belt and Road uh, assumes in this context. Uh, I'm just wondering how much of a, um, you know, uh, to what extent are China and Pakistan broadly on the same page when they look at how this end game in Afghanistan should be playing? I, I think that they are broadly on the same page. Um, as I said, I mean, of course, there are hardliners in, in Pakistan, even especially in the ISI, who still want complete Taliban victory. Uh, but that has never been the agenda, I think, of the, I mean, not since 2001, of the Pakistani establishment as a whole, including the, the military establishment. Uh, firstly, because, as I said, that does have potential future dangers for Pakistan. Um, but secondly, because... Uh, for the, you know, as in the 90s, but still more so, for the Taliban to, to, to achieve complete victory would mean years and years of civil, you know, of intensified civil war uh, with, you know, refugees flowing to, to, to Pakistan, deep instability on Pakistan's borders. And of course, Pakistan for its reasons and China for its reasons, not, you know, neither of them, um, neither of them want that. So they, I believe both in, in their somewhat different ways. You know, they, they want a, uh, a settlement in Afghanistan. They acknowledge and believe that this will have to involve a major role for the Taliban. Uh, but of course, you know, if one looks at the history of peace negotiations in Afghanistan, I mean, you know, not, not just between various rebel groups in Kabul, but, you know, I, I covered the negotiations among the Mujahideen groups themselves. In, in the 1980s with the Americans and the Pakistanis, both of them really, you know, banging heads together to try to get these people into a, 
you know, an effective anti-carbon coalition. Um, there, there's rather a, a nice um, anecdote by the former Pakistan Foreign Secretary um, about some of these discussions. Um, and um, this was about the possibility of a power sharing agreement with Najibullah in 90 or 91, I can't remember. And he says he was talking the, about this to one of the um, Mujahideen leaders, Yunus Khalis. And Yunus Khalis said to him, but Riyaz Saab, you don't understand. We in the Mujahideen are not fighting for a share of power. We are fighting for power. <laughs> And you know the, the, um, the you know, people for many many years people have you know drawn up plans for Afghanistan of various kinds, and the Afghans have shown a quite remarkable capacity to frustrate those plans. I mean, in the wider context of, of Belt and Road, um, of course, uh, Afghanistan is an important part, uh, but I think from the Chinese point of view, the Pakistani Iranian relationship is a much bigger part of that if you simply look at the geography of it. But that, of course, puts the Pakistanis in a, a, a terrible dilemma because of their, you know, the, the very important role of, of Saudi remittances in the Pakistani economy. Um, I, you know, I don't believe a single word of pledges to respect Afghan sovereignty. I mean, when is Pakistan that? But I think when it comes to the early withdrawal of American bases, that is an interesting point because, as I say, of this fear in Pakistan of you know, an intensified of the Americans withdrawing prematurely, of the whole thing collapsing into a sort of universal civil war uh, with um, you know, severe effects on, on Pakistan. I think that is a, a genuine Pakistani concern re reflected in that part of um, Imran Khan's op-ed. Rudy, you've been following the twists and turns and development of India's policy towards Afghanistan for, I suppose, a good about 15 years now. Uh, and does it surprise you to see how this has ended uh, with India actually showing up at the inaugural round of the talks and now more recently also hosting uh, Dr. Abdullah? Uh, but do you also think we should have gone there earlier? Uh, you know, does our sort of very long reluctance to have any dealings with the Taliban. Is it going to cost us something now by way of impeding what influence India might have had? Or is it the case that India doesn't really matter beyond just watching from a distance, so to speak? You know, Srinath, the Indian sport, I think India might have got here a lot earlier. And number two, I think it can go a lot further now that it is here. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, is clearly there's a change in the Indian position when it comes to Afghanistan. Rhetorically, it's the same, which is since Manmohan Singh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh visited Kabul, if I'm not mistaken, in 2006, he talked about India supporting an Afghan-led and Afghan-controlled process. But I think the reality is that neither is this Afghan-controlled nor is it Afghan-led. It's led by the Americans, and that's very clear. But I can understand why for public uh, consumption, you would continue with that rhetoric. It makes a lot of sense. In the last many years, various agencies, part of the government, have reached out to various different parts of the Taliban. I would not be surprised if there was a line to Iqbatyar, to Barada's team in Doha, um, to Taliban leaders who've helped out on kidnap and ransom issues, etc. And I think the one thing that you know we've been advocating for quite some time is an organized approach in dealing with the Taliban, because that's a reality. Now, it's difficult for lots of diplomats in India and for very good reason. Let's not forget that it was the Taliban that kept that essentially um, hosted a hijacked plane in IC-814 in the late 1990s. Um, it was the Taliban that provided safe haven to Pakistani terrorists to cross over and handed them over to Pakistan, one of which, of course, returned and orchestrated the attack against the Indian parliament. So I think... That is important to keep in mind, but so is reality and the future. Um, and one thing we've been advocating is to have a special envoy or a special advisor or something like a special representative who's able to pivot and keep in touch with the fast moving changes between Doha, Kabul, Washington, European capitals. And to be honest, I think it's outside the remit of any particular mission to do that. You need a dedicated person for whatever reason. And I think possibly more for bureaucratic rather than ideological reasons, the government has not done that. 
but I think it's but I think they've also embraced the reality. The external affairs minister made a digital presentation um, in Doha recently. The a joint secretary from the Ministry of External Affairs, a high level official, was represented in Doha. The Indian ambassador was represented in Doha on the 29th of February when this withdrawal agreement was signed up. Um, but I just hope that more is done to actually engage those parts of the Taliban that we might not find fanciful, but which are necessary. You know, the anthropologist Scott Aitren once said, the only way to do negotiation is in your own mind to so legitimize the other. There is no way in which you can proceed um, unless at some level you've accepted that you have legitimized the enemy or those that you can't get along with. And I sincerely hope for practical reasons, for Indian security more than anything else, that we are able to do this. So one final question for both of you, Anatole, maybe we could start with you. Uh, given where we are, November 2020, uh, I wonder what your thoughts are about the feasibility of any kind of an agreement coming to fruition, say, by next summer. Uh, I think that it is possible that you will have uh, an agreement by next summer. Um, certainly, I mean, if Trump, God forbid, is re-elected um, and really pushes hard for complete American withdrawal, then there will be immense impetus for that. Uh, but of course, you know, we, <laughs> we're we all talking about, you know, a, a, an Afghan settlement. Um, you know, the, the peace agreement with, uh, you know, with North Vietnam, right? It lasted 18 months. That's right. The, you know, the other question is whether any agreement involving uh, power sharing between the existing Kabul government and the Taliban could possibly work, you know, or last. Uh, I'm not saying it's impossible, uh, you know, it, but it would certainly require immense, as they did, sacrifices by both sides. Um, uh, because, you know, including, um, to, to, to be sort of cynical about it, um, on the Kabul government side, uh, you know, the Kabul government is held together by patronage. In many ways, the most important aid that the West can go on giving is, is not um, military aid, but you know, development aid, not not for development, you understand, uh, but yes. just to, to bribe, you know, um, regional leaders, warlords, chieftains in, in, in Afghanistan, and keep them on side. Well, of course, bringing the Taliban in, in will also involve sharing out that patronage. Now, you, so, you're, you, you know, you're, you're dividing up a smaller pie. That will be very, very difficult. But it's... On the Taliban side, if they are prepared to settle for hegemony in their core regions and in Kabul to have not Taliban people as such, because I you know, I, mean, I, I just can't imagine the Haqqani sitting at a cabinet table with Ashraf Ghani. My, my mind just can't, can't encompass that possibility. But, you know, there has been talk from the Taliban about how, how oh, you know, not, not our government, but a government of respected, neutral Islamic figures, uh, of course, uh, the nomination of which would involve, at the very least, a veto by us, you know, so we could see them as our representatives. Um, uh, something like that might work. But, you know, I, I'm afraid that if you really ask me to put my money on it, um, I would have to say that uh, uh, that if a settlement is reached, I I think the odds are that it won't last very long. Right. Rudy? Yeah. Um, you know, just two, three points. One is, had it not been for Trump's ill-advised statement yesterday that all Americans should be returned home by Christmas, I think something of a half agreement could have been expected by next summer, um, whether it was Trump or Biden. And by that, I mean is at least a reduction of violence, withdrawal, and perhaps even something of a ceasefire agreement could be expected. Beyond that, it's all bets off. So, you know, even if you're able to get to a place where there's enough trust for a ceasefire and you're able to verify a ceasefire, I think, as Anatole said, the idea of active Taliban commanders sitting around the table with people like Abdullah Saleh, with people like Abdullah Abdullah, with Atta Mohammed, or staunch anti-Taliban fighters, 
I mean, let's not forget that Amrullah Saleh is, you know, there's been an assassination attempt on him ever since the withdrawal agreement started and even before. Um, so that's, that would have been my perspective. But now, given Trump's statement, you know, I see very little hope in a agreement coming through. And let, let's keep in mind the February 29th, the, the text of the February 29th agreement makes clear that the end product is actually a UN product. It's a UN resolution, um, much like the Geneva Accords of 1988, which kind of brings them home. So to even think that we're going to go from reduction of violence to a UN resolution on peace in Afghanistan by next year, I think is unrealistic. Okay, on that very hopeful note, uh, Anatol, Rudy, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. I think it's been uh, a really fascinating discussion, very clear-eyed, uh, you know, harboring no illusions. Uh, but I hope we are all wrong and that something actually does work out. Uh, thanks for joining in, uh, Anatol. I think it was great to do this again after all those years of Afghanistan dialogues in London. Now I suppose this is the reality of the world in which we are. Yeah. Thank you all so much. It was great, great to see you again. Thank you for listening to this episode of Interpreting India. Stay safe and don't forget to wash your hands. For more information about the podcast and the production team, you can follow us on social media and visit our webpage. 